Verna, Verna, your your reaction. But my reaction is, I bring a lot of concern here to uh, from a lot of people. Uh, the main concern is uh, the, extra, uh, the Muslims here in this country then seem to assimilate. Mm -hmm. uh, when I, I come to Germany, from Germany in 1954, I was in intended to stay for two years, be here now for 57 years. I've become an Australian citizen uh, after five years, and I'm an Australian, and there are no divided loyalties. I'm an Australian. I've still got family in Germany. Uh, I'm saying you can be a little bit pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. And you're either Australian or you're not. Okay. Now, can, I, can I get a response from Mariam? Do you want to respond to that? What, what would you say to Verna? Yeah, um, in terms of the whole topic about Islamophobia, um, you know, the sentiment felt in Australia, I think, first of all, we do need to draw that distinction between what's felt in the US and what's felt in the UK versus what's felt here. Um, this talk of integration seems to come up quite a lot, and uh, the reason it's frustrating for me is that often I feel that, you know, how much more integrated do I need to be? Um, I work as a corporate solicitor, um, you know, in the corporate world. I live in the North Shore. We made references to that earlier. Um, I understand your concern with respect to a proportion of Muslims who, you know, generally live uh, perhaps in different areas of Sydney. Um, I think we need to understand the root cause of that, however. Um, and I think the other thing to, fo to um, you know, the other thing to focus on is that the media plays an enormous role in shaping people's perceptions about race, about religion, about Muslims. And, you know, with all due respect to some of the shows on television, you've got Today Tonight, you've got A Current Affair, which essentially on a fortnightly basis is sort of Muslim bashing. And so when you get... Um, um, you know, uh, the perception of Muslims through a lot of the people, mainstream people, their understanding of Islam is established through some ridiculous documentary focusing on extremism or a current affair, um, you know, Muslim bashing. So we've got to understand where are we get getting our knowledge about Muslims. And okay, quick, but, quick but, response. Well, well, I'm not here for Muslim bashing. I just want some answers. And somebody sent me a document here with a question that said, can a good Muslim be a good Australian? Yeah, and not? I didn't want to pub I, I didn't want to publish this on my blog because I didn't have mm. the answer was given by a man from South uh, who's lived in Australia 20 years mm. in Saudi Arabia, and his uh, reply is to that. Then I thought I had a friend I got a friend in Cairns who studies the Bible and especially the Quran as his hobby, and I sent that to him to have and he said. These questions I got here, I would like to ask you. Okay, we got, I'm sorry, we can't go through a list of questions on a piece of paper because we've got a lot of people in the room yeah, who, who do few, want to raise. But, but your question is, can a good Muslim be a good Australian? Yeah. Who'd, li who'd like to I'll, answer, I'll, I'll who'd like to answer that, Iqbal? Jenny, first, I think um, Noni has to be um, uh, probably given a, a, a copy of the authentic Quran because I, uh, if she says that 60% of the Quran is something that is uh, uh, against uh, the greater world, then obviously her understanding of the Quran is uh, probably from somebody who has a warped, a very warped uh, version of the Quran. Coming back uh, to this gentleman here about uh, a good, can a, um, a Muslim be a good Australian? There have been many, many Muslims in this country who have taken the highest of office. Ahmad Fahur, who has been the CEO of uh, National Australia Bank. Won't you call him a good Australian? There is a Muslim sitting in the federal parliament now, Adin Husic, good Australian as far as I'm concerned. Sister here, uh, who, is a, who is a lawyer, if she wasn't in this room and she was speaking, nobody would know whether she was a Muslim or a good Australian. Because as far as I'm concerned, she speaks as much an Australian as anybody else. So I mean, I think the debate has really gone to a lot of Muslim bashing, Islam bashing, because that is the sexy thing to do right now. All right. I, 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 want, to, I want to comment. No, no, no. I want to comment from, from Mark Jury because you're an Anglican vicar and you're a theologian. Is that right? Yes. Um, and you've talked about uh, the West having battered women's syndrome in relation to Islam. Now, what, what do you mean by that? When someone comes under abuse or attack, uh, one of the uh, characteristic responses is to blame yourself, especially if you're locked into a, uh, a relationship of uh, being attacked regularly and uh, making apologies for your abuser. It actually affects uh, Christians who live under Islamic, uh, in Islamic circumstances more and uh, one Palestinian Christian spoke about that problem of, of really want, needing to defend Islam in order to protect yourself. Some people in the West have responded to the terrorist attacks by trying to uh, look for everything that's positive in Islam. I think that was a strong response after 9-11, was to try and uh, reach out uh, as positively as possible. 
Um, but in the end, uh, uh, there are some disturbing messages in the Quran. There are declarations of war against non-believers. Um, there is a declaration that Islam should be triumphant over other religions. And uh, the, the problem is this is not just in the book, but there are preachers throughout the Islamic world that preach sermons on those messages, and we in the West are hearing about that. Okay, Sheikh Salim, would you like to respond quickly before we go to the break? Okay. The, the war well, ayat or whatever the verses related to war was revealed in the context of the war. Like, for example, I, I would like to ask Noni and the other people who are talking about this uh, war, when Australian government in its budget allocate money to buy F-16s, arms, does that mean that the Indonesia should be very, very scared that they are going to wage war against uh, Indonesia? The war situation was there, and at that time there was no formal army. There are no budgeting. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam, was guided through revelation at that time, so he was, he was confronting an enemy who is determined to eliminate the prophethood, the last message. So he had to take some constructive actions. So why he guides, the revelation guides him. The, to the, so you're to the, saying this is a document of its time? Is that, is that the point you're yeah, making? Yeah, I think anybody who is reading this one, the, 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 the context the itself says you have to gather the arm, I mean, uh, khayl, that is the uh, horses and, and, and the things. That is at the worst situation. Okay, I I Iqbal? Think, I think, Jenny, what uh, the Sheikh is saying is that if you read any book, and the Quran is, is in flowing Arabic. You have a very literal meaning, you have a thematic meaning, mm -hmm. and, and the, the context in how you pick each and every verse, it can be put in, in any context you want okay, to. Okay, and, and there's I think that's, that's plenty of slaying and stoning in the Bible too. I've, Absolutely. I've been reading some of those passages as well. But we're going to talk more about this in a moment. We have to go to a break. Coming up more on whether Islam is compatible with democracy, and we look at Sharia law as well. That's next on Insight. Tonight we're talking about rising anti-Islamic sentiment in Europe and the US and what is driving it. Um, Reza, I'd like to come back to you because we hear a lot about Sharia law and uh, I'd like you to explain from your perspective what it is and how important it is to Muslim identity. Well, there's really no such thing as just Sharia. It's not sort of one uh, monolithic uh, continuum. Sharia. Uh, is understood in thousands of different ways over the 1500 years in which multiple and competing schools of law have tried to construct some kind of uh, civic, penal, and family law code uh, that would uh, abide by Islamic values and principles. So it's understood in many, many different ways. But I think that there are three foundational issues, or three divisions, I should say, that usually Sharia fits into. One is penal law, of course, and that's really what gets all the attention. Uh, there are two countries in the world right now that actually have a federal mandate to, to uh, uh, enact penal law according to the Sharia. That's Saudi Arabia and Iran. Then there's financial law, obviously, which uh, has become quite popular, actually, in the U.S. and in the West ever since the global economic meltdown. And then there's something about family law, and that involves marriage, divorce, inheritance, uh, these kinds of issues. Um, and so when you say Sharia, even to a Muslim, you know, it's understood in, in vastly different ways. But in many ways, it's sort of part of an identity. And, and most Muslims, when they talk about wanting Sharia to play a role in their lives, really mean it insofar as it uh, talks about family law, uh, you know, issues like, as I said, marriage, divorce. In the United States, we have all across this country uh, dozens of so-called halakha courts in which particularly observant Jews can take these issues of family law to a, a, an orthodox court uh, and have that, have that judge, uh, judge for them. Uh, in the UK, they do the same thing, of course, with Catholic and Jewish communities. Um, and we're seeing also throughout Europe uh, the same thing uh, happening now with certain Muslim communities who are also looking uh, to Sharia courts. And again, as long as these courts don't violate the laws of the land and as long as there's a room for appeal should one or two parties disagree with the verdict, um, I don't see how this would have anything to do with you know, being incompatible with what we refer to as Western ideas of democracy. But how comfortably do those values in Sharia law sit with democratic values? There's no such thing as values in Sharia law. That's what I was trying to explain. I mean, Sharia law is understood 
in thousands of different ways by tens of thousands of different institutions uh, who really disagree with each other uh, far more than they disagree with people of other religions. So the values that you bring to Sharia are whatever values you yourself have. If you're a you know, bigot and a misogynist and a, a violent person, then your interpretation of Sharia is going to be bigoted and violent and misogynistic. If you're a Democrat and a pluralist uh, and, and, you know, someone who's peace-loving, then that's how you'll see the Sharia. Okay, Nani, response from you. This is very evasive. Sharia law is a malignant law and it's totally based on the interpretation of the Quran, the Hadith, and the way Muslim, um, Islam and the, the Prophet lived. So I don't understand why uh, he's whitewashing the meaning of Sharia. Sharia is a set because of laws that are very... Because I'm a scholar of Sharia, very, that's uh, why. Excuse me, excuse me, I'm a scholar of Sharia too. Uh, the, excuse the, me? Uh, Sharia, Sharia is the most oppressive system on earth. It encourages people to lie if it's for the benefits of Islam. It doesn't allow Muslims to leave Islam. And there is a death penalty in all the schools of Sharia against those who leave Islam. Uh, Sharia defines what jihad is. Sharia is very clear. It's not as, as uh, These are just he's trying to show it. False statements. Sharia, please, I, I'm I am kind of speaking. Confused. Okay, okay. I did not interrupt. All right, you. all right. Just, just okay. Uh, Sharia, Nani, very quickly, and I'll get a response from Reza. Jihad, is, yeah, jihad is defined as a war against Muslims to establish the religion. Uh, the West is concerned. Let's be open with them. Why the, why the, this deception? Okay, Reza, moderate a quick response Muslims, from you. Moderate, moderate Muslims are trying to convince the West that Sharia is good. Okay, instead Nani, I'm going to stop you there. To, I, th I think you've made your point, trying, and I'm going to stop you there because yeah. we have a lot of other people who want to talk. Reza, quickly a response. I, I don't really have a response to that. Every single word that she said is factually incorrect. So I don't really know what to say. Okay, Rhonda, can I get a response from yeah. you? Because um, I, think, I think some people fear Sharia when they look at what happens in some Islamic countries and they see severe human rights abuses, mm -hmm. for example. What's your response to what Noni has said? And what's your reaction to that fear that people have about Sharia law? Well, I, I want to make three points about Sharia very quickly because it's hard to to talk about such a huge topic in sound bites. But the first is that we must recognize both non Muslims and Muslims that the Quran is a text. We need human engagement with that text. So we have to first understand that. The, the rulings and the, the legal rulings that are produced are channeled through the human mind. It is an interpretive act of a human being engaging and interacting with a text that produces the legal result. Now, because of that, it is susceptible to flaws. It is not perfect. Nobody has perfect access to the divine will. The second point I'd like to make is that because of this potential for abuse, there needs to be more women scholars. And that's not something new. We need to return to that glorified past and get more women scholars involved to overcome the, pa the fetters of patriarchy. And the third point is that if, as we accept, God is the perfect epitome of justice, goodness, mercy and compassion, then our efforts to define the, the divine will through, through Sharia um, should be predicated on achieving a result that is merciful compassion. Any one of these points, if, it was, if they, people were mindful of them, people like the Taliban or people in despotic theocratic regimes were mindful of these principles, I think that would help in overcoming the travesty which we see, which is an abuse of Islam to uh, exact an appalling oppression of people's rights. Okay. Othman, you're um, a member of Hizbut Tahrir, an Islamic group which is banned in a number of countries. Your response to what Rhonda's saying, is that your interpretation of Islam? Well, look, I think uh, I'd like to question the premise that's been put forth, not particularly by Rhonda, but by, by, by others, implicitly that, uh, you know, it's democracy and the Enlightenment um, that Islam needs to be uh, compared against, and it's as if Western liberalism is a standard and the Sharia here is on trial and we can ask questions, well, what is the Sharia? Is it compatible? Is it not compatible? These questions can be flipped on their head. But fundamentally, fundamentally, uh, I think no one is silly enough to say there's no fundamental differences between Islam and, and Western ideology. The question is, is that what is behind the rise of anti-Islamic uh, anti sentiment? I don't think so. Um, Really? But I want to get back to, I mean, I'm interested in Rhonda's interpretation of, of Islam and, and what she has to say about Islam. Do you agree with her? Do you see it the way she sees it?